Quantum mechanics really comes from new ideas and experiments on the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter. But because it comes to form the foundation of atomic and molecular science, it's often encountered at an early stage, usually high school chemistry, long before most students learn anything in depth about electromagnetic waves and radiation. And because quantum mechanics is famously weird, all this associated craziness of quantum mechanics is just thrown at you with no physical intuition to build on. Now, of course, when the greats like Einstein, Bohr, and Schrodinger were creating quantum mechanics, they discovered that there were some crazy things about the behavior of atomic molecular systems. But they were forced to take that step into the unknown after trying as much as they could and failing to make sense of new experimental results with classical theory. And it's this contrast with classical intuition that quantum mechanics forces on us that is the essence of its weirdness. But these days, students are taught, sometimes as early as high school chemistry, about things meant to sound mysterious and weird, like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or Schrodinger's wave equation, things that, because of their weirdness and coolness, have entered the popular culture. And you learn about these things without that strong foundation in classical theory, without that solid physical intuition. You learn, for example, about emission or absorption of a photon. It appears, I think, in many people's minds in a cartoonish sci-fi way. A photon is this magical thing being absorbed. Well, yes, there's some strange things about the quantum mechanical understanding of emission or absorption of a photon, but the ability of a molecule to emit or absorb a photon itself is not some crazy sci-fi futuristic idea. It's a very well understood concept, which is at the core of our modern technology and which dates the 19th century. The prototypical example of emission and absorption of radiation is the transmission or reception of radio waves by a tower or radio. Simple, not crazy, Perhaps amazing when it was first discovered, but not so anymore. But it makes no sense to learn about the quantum mechanical description of light emission and absorption, and to hear about the weird features of quantum mechanics without first understanding this simple, fundamental, everyday example of radiation emission and absorption. Usually the way the story is told is that there were new experiments around 1900, the turn of the century, and new equations were derived to explain these experiments and that the equations had little physical intuition or logic associated with them, but that they simply worked. And it's often said that the equations of quantum mechanics cannot be derived, which is basically true. Historically, they were essentially just guessed. But if you understand a little bit about classical radiation theory, then you can appreciate what's new and unexpected about these quantum mechanical ideas and equations. The fundamental principle of classical radiation theory you must understand before getting into quantum mechanics is that acceleration of charges and currents, non-uniform motion, produces radiation. And radiation produces a force on charges and currents, that is, it causes them to accelerate. Although electromagnetic radiation is different than physical matter because it propagates through empty space without a medium, we can understand it by way of analogy with more physically intuitive types of waves that propagate in matter, such as sound. When I pluck a guitar string, why does it ring out? Well, the string starts vibrating, pushing back and forth on air molecules, and inducing a self-propelling wave in the air that propagates outward. We hear it when those vibrations of air molecules hit our ears and start vibrating receptor cells. Let's take this a little further. Musicians know that when a note is played on one instrument, another properly tuned instrument across the room may ring out. How does that work? As before, playing the note, say plucking a guitar string, makes the string vibrate. The vibrations of the string push on air molecules. The vibrations of air molecules travel across the room as a sound wave. And now when they reach another instrument, say another properly tuned guitar, those vibrations acting on the still string start to push on it, inducing it to vibrate. Why only the properly tuned string? Because the properly tuned string has a natural frequency that it wants to vibrate at. If that frequency matches the frequency of incoming air molecule vibrations, the pushing of air molecule vibrations is synchronized with the pushing of the string. To put it simply, the air molecules are always pushing in the same direction as the motion of the string, and act so as to speed it up. If the string is not tuned to the same frequency of vibration as the air molecules, some of the pushes act against the motion of the string, that is, in the opposite direction, and cause it to slow down. 
Over many vibration, it works out that only a properly tuned string can be set in vibration by an incoming wave with the same frequency. And this is known as resonance. So to recap this whole process of emission to traveling wave to absorption, we have a guitar string being plucked. It vibrates. The vibrating string pushes on air molecules. Those air molecules push on other air molecules and spread out across the room. Then those vibrating air molecules reach another guitar string and push on it, making it vibrate. Let's take this even further. How does this process result in energy transfer? In the emission of a wave in the sound wave analogy, the string pushing on the air results in the air pushing back on the string, essentially an application of Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For example, like when one ball collides with another, slowing down as it sets another in motion. A force accelerating the ball at rest comes with an opposite force slowing down the moving ball. So in the sound wave example, the string starts shaking and as it pushes on the air, the air pushes back on it. The air molecules start to vibrate and the vibration of the string slows down. Then at the other end, with absorption, when a sound wave encounters a guitar string and makes it ring out, we have the same process in reverse. The vibrating air molecules push on the string, speeding it up, setting it in motion, and the string pushes back on the air molecules, slowing them down. Energy is thus transferred from the vibrating object to the wave and vice versa. For emission and absorption of light or electromagnetic waves, the electromagnetic field created by the vibrating charge pushes back on the charge, slowing it down. Say in a radio tower, when a radio transmitter is emitting a signal, there are vibrating electrons in the big radio antenna. As those vibrating electrons create an electromagnetic wave that propagates outward, the wave pushes back on the electrons and slows them down. That's why it takes energy to emit the radio signal. And then in absorption, the charge which is set in motion by the incident wave induces its own field, which cancels out and extinguishes the incoming field. So when the incoming wave encounters a radio receiver, electrons in the antenna start to vibrate and their vibration creates a secondary field which cancels out the incoming wave. That's why energy is absorbed from the incoming wave when receiving the signal. By the way, the fact that the electromagnetic wave itself carries energy, enough energy to induce a current in the receiver antenna, and then possibly to make a small earphone vibrate from that current to reproduce a sound. That's why the simplest radios, crystal radios, require no battery or external power source. Electromagnetic wave to current in antenna to shaking of the speaker to hearing sound. So far, this whole discussion has been classical. We've talked about emission and absorption and energy transfer, and the concept of resonance, and the fact that this energy transfer between matter and wave occurs when the vibrating object vibrates at the same frequency as the wave. This is the foundation of classical intuition that is necessary to appreciate what is new in quantum mechanics. So the foundational rule of quantum mechanics is E equals HF. Light can only be emitted in discrete units with energy proportional to frequency. The weirdness of relating energy to frequency is that we would have previously expected the frequency of vibration to matter only to relate to the frequency of wave emitted or absorbed. The concept of resonance discussed previously and as the vibration occurs, we previously expected that the energy is continuously transferred in any amount. We don't just suddenly forget about our classical picture of radiation. No, this new equation adds an additional constraint on top of what we already know. We still expect that for a wave to be emitted or absorbed with frequency f, we need something vibrating at that frequency. To make this consistent with E equals hf, we can no longer have the vibration continuously transfer energy. Rather, we need something to be vibrating at frequency f in the material system as it makes a transition corresponding to an energy difference of eight. That's why the whole E equals hf thing is unexpected. And when the system is in a steady state of energy, we don't want it to be vibrating at all because that would lead to radiation being emitted. The resolution to all this is to have energy states described by a wave function that depends on spatial coordinates, 
multiplied by a time oscillating function with frequency determined by inverting the relation E equals HF to give F equals E over H. Combined with the rule that the square modulus of the wave function represents the probability density, it all works out very nicely. In a single state of energy, the square modulus of the wave function loses its time dependence. In a superpositional state, where the wave function is a linear combination of energy states, taking the square modulus of the wave function produces an interference term which oscillates with the frequency given by the difference in energy of those states divided by h. So you can see how this relation E equals hf and the classical picture that something needs to be vibrating at frequency f for a photon to be emitted with that frequency with that, we can almost guess what the correct equations of quantum mechanics will look like. We can appreciate why they're weird, and it basically builds from there.